Okay, welcome everybody from AMSSM. I'm uh, Chris Cornell, I'm an MSIG member. Um, tonight we have Jonathan Dresner, Dr. Jonathan Dresner from University of Washington. Uh, hold on, sorry. Dr. Jonathan Dresner is a professor in the Department of Family Medicine and director of the UW Medicine Center for Sports Cardiology at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. He is team physician for the Seattle Seahawks, NFL, Seattle Reign, and WSL, and the University of Washington Huskies. Dr. Dresner is past president of the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine from 2012 to 2013, and serves as deputy editor for the British Journal of Sports Medicine. He is also director of the Division for Cardiac Injury and in Sport for the National Center for Catastrophic Sports Injury Research. Dr. Dresner has dedicated his career to the prevention of sudden cardiac arrest and death, in young athletes and the development of effective models for prevention. His primary research focuses on the incidence and etiology of SCAD, cardiovascular screening and ECG interpretation in athletes and emergency response planning and the use of automated external defibrillators in the school and athletic settings. Uh, throughout the webinar, you're encouraged to type in your questions in the Q&A panel. And then after uh, Dr. Dresner's <coughs> presentation, we'll go through the list um, and we'll answer some of your questions at the end. So without any further ado, Dr. Dresner, feel free to take it away. Sounds good. All right, thanks, Chris, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for spending a little bit of your time with us this evening to talk about ECG interpretation. Um, I'm gonna do a couple just audio checks, one with Chris right now, we doing okay? Perfect. Um, and what I'm gonna do now is just switch over to slides and we're gonna talk about ECG interpretation in athletes um, and then come back to sort of a live shot camera view at the end for the Q&A. So hold on just a second here while we um, switch over. There we go. And just one second here. I'm going to just turn off the camera for a second. Camera. Turn off the camera. All right. Chris, just double checking. You can still hear me? Yeah, we're good. Okay, excellent. Um, so going back to the um, shared screen here. Hold on a second. There we go. I think we're good. Uh, Joan, you can text me if something's not working, um, but I think we're all right on this webinar here. So um, we're gonna get rolling with ECG interpretation in athletes and really talk about the international criteria. Um, I'm in Seattle, Washington. I'm at the University of Washington, um, working our sports medicine fellowship, take care of some of our teams here and have had a, a, a large interest in sports cardiology really since becoming a, a sports medicine physician. Uh, I don't have any relevant disclosures. I think for those who are interested in sports medicine, um, this is a really important statistic. You know, 75% of all fatalities in sport are cardiovascular related. And, and this struck me early in my training um, where you guys are right now in medical school, as well as in residency that Within sports medicine, one of our largest responsibility is the safety of the athletes that we care for. And so if we can't accomplish this reduction of sudden cardiac death in sports, um, um, this really is one of our uh, most important priorities. So why ECG? You know, ECG is used uh, in different contexts. A lot of times we use it um, for diagnostic reasons, to evaluate symptoms, uh, abnormal physical exam, perhaps an abnormal family history. Um, we also use it for screening, for cardiovascular screening, um, for better identification of heart muscle diseases called cardiomyopathy, some of the electrical disorders like ion channel disorders or ventricular preexcitation. You know, hey, accurate ECG interpretation requires a few things. Dr. Desner? Yes, sir. Okay, it seems like our presenters are, they were chiming in that they could not hear us. So I can hear you and you can hear me, but 
Uh, we're oh. not getting the audio to the audience right now. All right, let's see what we got here. That's a problem. Uh, if anyone um, is on the, the webinar right now, can okay, okay, we're starting to get some. Uh, yeah, they can hear. Never mind. Let's continue with the webinar. <laughs> All right. Let me see if I can get back to it now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just put that on full screen and everybody to go. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, nope, that's not it. One sec. Sorry about that. It's not on my screen now. Oh, yikes. There we go. All right, I think we should be good. Um, so again, so accurate ECG interpretation requires some things that we need to think about. Um, we have to have knowledge of the physiologic adaptations um, related to regular training, also known as athlete's heart. Um, we have to have an understanding of the ECG abnormalities that suggest there might be a pathological disorder. These are the uh, ECG findings that would require additional investigation. Um, we need proper secondary testing of an abnormal ECG. Um, I think doing this well requires some training and experience, so that's why we're starting here. Um, and we need some cardiology resources to help with the secondary testing and some of the, uh, the follow-up. Um, so what we're going to do for the next 40 minutes is talk briefly about the evolution of ECG interpretation standards. And then I want to review um, the most recent rendition called the International Criteria. Um, I'm going to share with you how I look at an ECG and try to explain the six steps that I use for ECG interpretation in athletes. Um, we're going to show lots of ECG examples. That's probably the bulk of the presentation. Um, and then at the end, just spend a, a few comments on application of ECG within sports medicine uh, and some additional resources for you. And then we'll have some Q&A. So athletes' heart or physiologic cardiac adaptations um, are really important to understand. Regular training um, causes some changes in the heart, increased vagal tone as well as uh, enlarged chamber size. And on the enlarged chamber size, we have both wall thickness uh, increases as well as cavity dimension uh, increases. Increased vagal tone causes some expected physiologic uh, cardiac uh, adaptations that manifest on an ECG, such as sinus bradycardia, sinus arrhythmia, early repolarization, even first degree AV block, and Mobitz type one, second degree AV block, these are all physiologic uh, findings on an ECG. Likewise, the enlarged chamber size, you can expect that left ventricular hypertrophy by voltage criteria, as well as incomplete right bundle branch block are, are also physiologic findings in the athletes. In a really well-trained population, LVH criteria is present in over 50% of young athletes. So again, if you're using LVH and other um, clinical uh, realms, it might uh, predict some heart disease or, or presence of hypertension with end organ damage. But in the young athlete community, voltage criteria for LVH is not a good distinguisher uh, for disease. And a lot of these findings are also affected by the type of sport, someone's age or sex, um, maybe their body size, race, and genetics. ECG uh, interpretation um, really evolved in about 2010 by the European Society of Cardiology and Domenico Corrado led a statement for the first time separating uh, ECG findings into two groups. Group one was common training related ECG changes uh, and group two were uncommon and training unrelated ECG changes that might indicate a pathologic heart condition. Um, a group in uh, 2011 out of Stanford with some international input uh, revised these a little bit. And this led to uh, an international panel that we convened in Seattle 
to develop what was known as the Seattle Criteria in 2013. Shortly after 2013 and 2014, um, Sanjay Sharma and his group, uh, yet again, uh, based on new science and evidence and some studies, um, came out with the revised criteria. And this ultimately led to convening another international panel of experts in Seattle in uh, 2015 uh, to develop the, the latest rendition, which is the international criteria uh, for ECG interpretation in athletes. Um, this was published in a couple cardiology journals as well as BGSM. And importantly, in that yellow box, it was endorsed by 17 different sports medicine and cardiology societies around the world. And I think right now really does represent the current standard for looking at a young athlete's ECG. The international criteria um, does two things. It updated our ECG interpretation standards. And the second thing was really important. It developed a very clear guide for the appropriate evaluation of ECG abnormalities. So specifically it linked an ECG abnormal finding with the appropriate next steps in that evaluation. And I think this is critical, especially for sports medicine physicians. So they know how to look at the ECG and they also know what to order next or perhaps who to get involved uh, to help with that evaluation. This is the figure that summarizes the international criteria. And as, as you can see, it um, separates ECG findings into three boxes. Green are really the normal ECG findings in athletes. Um, red are the clearly abnormal ECG findings in athletes. And in the international criteria, we also have this yellow box or sort of cautionary findings or borderline findings. Um, the yellow box is important to understand because uh, any one of those findings in isolation is not enough to consider the ECG abnormal. So for in that borderline group, you have to have two or more of the findings to consider the ECG uh, abnormal. One question that uh, has come up a lot as we've modified the criteria over time is does modifying the criteria come with a cost? Do we sacrifice the sensitivity to improve specificity? And there have been multiple studies on this on several of the renditions of the ECG criteria. Um, and as you can see, the performance um, with the performance of the ECG standards, regardless of the rendition of ECG uh, criteria over time, the false positive rate declined with each successive um, rendition. And, it, and, and the false positive rate declined without any change in the sensitivity to detect the conditions that are important related to sudden cardiac death. So this is important for you. So when, if you're handed an ECG in a young athlete, um, the first question that, that I'm gonna um, try to answer is whether or not this ECG is classified as normal or abnormal. And, and that's really important. If it's normal, then no further evaluation is needed. And if the ECG is considered abnormal, then further evaluation is needed. There may be borderline ECG findings but there's no such thing as a borderline ECG because a borderline ECG doesn't tell you what to do. Are you gonna do nothing? So it's really normal. Or is that borderline ECG concerning enough that you're just gonna consider it abnormal and do more evaluation? If the ECG is abnormal, what specific ECG abnormality is it? And therefore what's the appropriate next step in the evaluation? Um, and then what are some of the other relevant clinical information that you need to understand as you interpret the ECG again some of these might be based on age, uh, race, uh, sex of the athlete. And for the international criteria, this is mostly assuming that the athlete is asymptomatic and without a family history of inherited cardiac disease or early sudden cardiac death. So let's talk about the six steps for ECG interpretation in athletes, and then we're gonna walk through these. And I'm gonna show you on the screen sort of how my eyes flow when I look at an ECG. So step one, I look at the precordial leads, and this, the precordial leads are V1 through V6, and then we look over towards the limb leads. And the first step is I'm looking for things that clearly make the ECG abnormal. Um, Q waves, ST segment depression, and T wave inversion. I go back through the precordial leads and the limb leads again, looking mostly at the QRS morphology, looking for uh, pre-excitation, bundle branch blocks, uh, basically conduction delays that make the, the QRS complex look wide. Um, step three and four are rather quick, but we'll look at the axis. We'll look for atrial enlargement. I look at the rhythm strip at the bottom that is usually lead two or V5. And then the last thing I do is I get a rough estimate of the QT interval and compare it to the machine read uh, for the QT interval. 
the reason that I uh, developed this system is because my assumption going in in a young athlete population is that the ECG is going to be normal. Um, and what I'm trying to do is is systematically find the e any finding that would therefore flag the ECG as abnormal and warranting more evaluation. So here's how the six steps look when I when I where my eyes uh, go. So if we start up in V1, I run down the QRS complex, uh, P wave, you know, Q QRS complex, T wave for those who haven't done much ECG interpretation. Um, and my eyes go right down from V1 through V3, up to V4, and then down V5, V6. And then I come over to V, to, excuse me, uh, lead AVF, which is one of the inferior leads, up to AVL, over to lead two, and up to one. So that's how my eyes uh, go. You may ask, why aren't we looking at AVR and lead three? And there's some good reason there for an AVR, there's usually T wave inversion and uh, not much diagnostic information from AVR. And lead three, we exclude for uh, Q waves as well as T wave inversion because the, um, it, it occurs there commonly. And so again, I sort of leave that out uh, in the beginning. Then I look, at, uh, look for at the axis um, and if it's upright in one and, and two, we'll know we're in uh, a normal axis for a young athlete. I'll look at the P wave in lead two, uh, looking for atrial enlargement, either left atrial enlargement uh, with a wide P wave or uh, right atrial enlargement with a tall peak P wave. Um, I'll look at the rhythm strip at the bottom, step five. And then the last thing I do is I look at the QT interval and uh, we'll go through this uh, at the end. What's really important um, in this interpretation is you have to understand what are the definitions of normal versus normal, uh, normal versus abnormal as we go through this. I encourage everyone to read the international criteria document and understand what's in there. And these are tables that are directly from there that have very clear definitions um, and details of, of what um, normal versus uh, abnormal ECG findings are. So let's look at some of the normal findings in athletes that we, we see. And again, right now, let's just stick to step one, uh, looking for Q waves, ST segment depression, uh, and T wave inversion. And uh, this is the ECG we we're looking at before. Um, and again, if you can follow my cursor here um, from V1, I don't see any Q waves. I don't see any ST segment depression. I don't see any inverted T waves. Um, I go from V4, V5, V6 over to AVF again, no pathologic Q waves, no ST segment depression, no inverted T waves, over to lead two, up to lead one. Um, this is a normal ECG in a young athlete and it actually represents an ECG just with high um, QRS voltage, meeting criteria for LVH, but without any other abnormality um, to flag it as an abnormal ECG. Here's another ECG uh, in a young healthy athlete. Um, V1 often has T wave inversion. And if you read the criteria specifically about what makes it abnormal, you have to have um, T wave inversion in two or more contiguous leads, um, excluding uh, V1 and lead three. So um, this really doesn't count here. So we're looking for, again, Q waves, ST segment depression, T wave inversion. Um, note the ST segment elevation here, which is early repolarization and a very tall peak T wave. Um, those are normal findings in an athlete. Same thing here. We have some ST segment elevation, but that's a, a normal finding in an athlete um, representing early repolarization. And again, my eyes go up to AVL, lead two, and lead one. Um, so these findings um, really represent early repolarization in an athlete, and these are normal um, physiologic findings. Here's an example of incomplete right bundle branch block which is defined as an RSR prime uh, in V1 uh, and QRS duration less than 120 milliseconds. This is a fairly common um, QRS morphology in lead V1 um, in a well-trained athlete. Um, black athletes um, have been shown to have a repolarization variant that is present often in leads V1 through V4. And it looks like this. Um, this repolarization variant um, appears as convex ST segment elevation followed by a negative T wave. And so if we look at ST segment elevation followed by a neg negative T wave, that pattern, which is confined only through V4, 
is actually a pattern that has been, excuse me, um, described in uh, black athletes um, and does not represent pathology. This is a repolarization variant um, that is considered normal. Here's another example of a black athlete repolarization variant. Again, um, J point elevation, convex uh, ST segment elevation, followed by a negative T wave inversion. Again, confined only to V1 through V4. If this continued into V5 with T wave inversion, it would be considered abnormal um, and require additional investigation. Juvenile T wave inversion is another normal type of T wave inversion. Um, juvenile T-wave inversion is, is remnant of some of the pediatric uh, um, changes uh, that develop over time with a, uh, through the heart where it moves a little bit from right-sided to, to left-sided uh, dominance. And um, you can see here T-wave inversion in, in V1, V2, and V3 in a 12-year-old, uh, which is considered normal. Juvenile T-wave inversion, uh, which occurs in leads V1, V2, and V3, is normal in individuals under 16 years old and typically have not gone through puberty yet either. Here's another example of um, juvenile T wave inversion um, in V1 through V3 um, on the left and on the right ECG only in V2 and V3. Um, what you have to understand about juvenile T wave inversion is this a normal finding based on age. It's independent of race. Um, and it does not extend to lead V4. And so just pause for a second, because already the details of the definition are really important. We talked about the black athlete repolarization variant um, that is confined to V1 through V4, but juvenile TV inversion is age dependent, not race dependent, um, and really confined from V1 to V3. Let's move to some abnormal ECG findings. This is a table that comes from the international criteria. We're going to focus most on the T wave inversion, um, SC segment depression, and pathologic Q waves. So, this ECG looks markedly different than the ones we just looked at. And if we followed our step one, just looking for Q waves, uh, SC segment depression, or T wave inversion, and we start in V1, that looks okay. This looks okay. As I get down to V3, I see some SD segment depression and T wave inversion. Again, V4, SD segment depression and T wave inversion. Same in V5, V6, even some in AVF, AVL, 2, and lead 1. I don't think anyone would, would not recognize this as an abnormal ECG and different from the patterns that we looked at before. Um, this is an ECG with infralateral T wave inversion and SC segment depression from an athlete uh, patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here's another example of infralateral um, T wave inversion. Um, again, just coming down, we already start to see it in V2. Um, we pick it up again in V4, V5 with some SD segment depression, as well as V6, and we see it in the inferior leads as well. T wave inversion beyond V4 um, is always abnormal. So if it extends to V5 and V6, or into the inferior or lateral leads, uh, one in AVL, it's considered abnormal. Um, the evaluation of infralateral T wave inversion is, um, needs to be comprehensive. Um, echocardiography, cardiac MRI really is uh, standard, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. And whole turn stress testing uh, for some gray zone findings, which uh, we won't have too much time to talk about uh, in this presentation. Um, this is an example of just lateral T wave inversion. So we can see some um, uh, T wave inversion in V2 and V3, and then extending into V4. V5 and V6, but we don't see it quite as much in the inferior leads. This is also an abnormal pattern of um, T wave inversion requires additional uh, investigation. Um, in that international criteria document, I mentioned that there's a very clear link between specific abnormalities and what the next step is. So if we're looking specifically at T wave inversion, lateral, infralateral, it talks about in the table, the potential cardiac diseases related to that, the recommended evaluation, and then some considerations regarding that evaluation. Um, I mentioned that cardiac MRI really is a routine diagnostic test um, for lateral or infralateral T wave inversion. And the reason is to look for something called apical HCM or apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Cardi uh, HCM is uh, typically uh, asymmetric pathologic hypertrophy within the left ventricle, often involving the interventricular septum 
but sometimes in, uh, involves the apex and the apex of the heart is hard to get an ultrasound perpendicular to. So the echocardiogram can sometimes miss it. Um, and that's why cardiac MRIs uh, really become a standard test for evaluating markedly abnormal ECGs. Another reason that we look forward is this study um, that uh, compared athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy compared to sedentary patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I'll just draw your attention to the red uh, section on the, on the bottom left for the athletes with the HCM, where over a third of them had apical variant HCM. So again, perhaps the, the one of the more common morphologic patterns of HCM in terms of where in the heart does it affect is actually the apex in athletes. And so um, we have to rule that out. And the best way to rule that out is with a cardiac MRI. It's also important that when you have a markedly abnormal ECG, if they do have normal initial imaging, like normal echo, normal MRI, that that's not the end of the story. We have to follow those individuals. This was a publication by Antonio Pliccia in New England Journal of Medicine, 2008. Um, 81 athletes who had this type of markedly abnormal pattern, you can see here in like V5, they all had normal initial imaging studies and they were followed by on average for nine years. And 6% of them went on to develop a, a definitive cardiomyopathy in, in follow-up. And so the bottom line is that the ECG or electrical manifestations of cardiomyopathy may actually show up first and the morphologic changes second. And so if you have a markedly abnormal ECG and normal initial imaging studies, that's, you have to continue following that athlete uh, throughout their career and even beyond. This was the case for one, for one of my patients. This is the ECG of uh, one of my basketball players here from the University of Washington. He was 19 years old when he uh, uh, came in as a freshman. Um, he was a really, really terrific player. We were excited to have him. Um, and on the uh, top panel is his ECG. And you can see that back then in September 2008, he had uh, inverted T waves in V5 as well as, uh, excuse me, in V4 as well as in V5. Maybe if you look at V3, maybe this is the black athlete repolarization variant. Um, but there is no J point elevation or um, ST segment elevation in V4. This was an, uh, an abnormal ECG. And we did an echo and a cardiac MRI, and it was normal. And he returned to play. And then we followed him about every six months with an ECG and an echo. Um, and in 2010, two years later, you can see the progression of his T-wave inversion, now quite dramatic in the, uh, in the lateral leads, and a repeat cardiac MRI um, that now showed definitive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, in the apex with a max thickness of 20 millimeters and a little bit of late gadolinium enhancement. Here's his cardiac MRI um, in, uh, in a uh, axial uh, view, short axis view, excuse me, uh, in September 2008 compared to 2010. And again, you can see the change in thickness from really about 13 millimeters to 20 millimeters just in those two years of time and how the ECG overlays uh, across that. So um, big take home point here. If you have a markedly abnormal ECG, you have to continue to follow it. They get yearly evaluations at a minimum. Um, and in, until they have the morphologic changes, they're probably okay to play, um, but, but you have to keep following them. Let's move to um, some abnormalities, not in the infralateral or lateral leads, but looking again at the anterior uh, leads here um, in contrast with what we saw before. So um, we were looking at normal uh, variants of anterior T of inversion before in black athletes or uh, athletes under 16 years old. Um, so this is a 21-year-old uh, Caucasian athlete with two of inversion in, in V2 and V3 and V4. Um, and this is an abnormal pattern and, and could be suspicious for something like arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Here's another example of uh, abnormal T of inversion again. Uh, you see here in V2, V3. What's really different about this T wave inversion is there's no J point elevation. The J point is the end of the QRS before the ST segment. It's totally flat um, and uh, suspicious when it's flat or depressed that goes into the, the T wave. Um, and this is a, another uh, example of a athlete um, with a rhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Um, and this athlete also has a few um, uh, premature ventricular beats uh, on the CCG as well. Inferior T wave inversion uh, can also be abnormal, and this is an example of that. The inferior leads are uh, AVF, so 2, 3, and AVF. Um, I mentioned earlier that we don't really include lead 3 for Q waves or T wave inversion, 
So the criteria is very specific. If you have in, inferior TBA inversion and you need two or more leads, you basically need both lead two and AVF to be uh, considered abnormal. And that's what's present here. This is next ECG um, was from the NFL combine. It was interpreted as abnormal um, by the local cardiologist um, based on TBA inversion findings in three in AVF. Um, this is not, the, this. ECG does not meet criteria for being abnormal because we exclude Lee 3. Um, this is actually a normal ECG. That athlete did go on to more testing and, and as expected, uh, it was normal. So again, really understanding the specific definition um, that we're looking at is quite important. Pathologic Q waves, um, the Q wave is the beginning of the QRS complex and um, in the Seattle criteria, um, one of the um, standards that we really need to alter was our definition of pathologic Q waves. It was the leading cause of false positive ECG interpretations based on the Seattle criteria, where we defined a, an abnormal Q wave as something more than three millimeters. And for all the athletes with a lot of voltage uh, on the QRS complex, um, a lot of them had Q waves that were just sort of large to go along with their large um, uh, R wave amplitude. And so it was just not a good criteria and we changed it to a, a, a ratio and this was based on some science that was there um, looking at uh, both athletes as well as cardiomyopathy um, and we changed the ratio uh, the new definition to a, a qr ratio of greater than 0.25 or uh, a q wave that's more than 25 percent of the ensuing r wave um, or a q wave that's more than 40, uh, 40 milliseconds in duration 40 milliseconds is one of the small boxes on an ecg so here's an example of just big Q waves because there's um, nothing else that goes with it in V4, V5, and V6. This was a, a college swimmer with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then this is a, a, a pretty abnormal ECG with lots of findings on it, but specifically related to, to Q waves. If you look at lead two and AVF, you can see sort of a broad Q wave as well as a Q wave that is well more than 25% of the ensuing R wave. Um, and this was an, another athlete with a, a type of cardiomyopathy called dilated cardiomyopathy. So all that was really just step one. There's a lot to look at, but let's move uh, quickly to um, step two. Um, step two, I look through the, 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 my eyes go through the same way, but I'm looking for different things. I'm looking for pre-excitation um, as well as uh, bundle branch block and just conduction delays. So if we look at this ECG here, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, V1, V2, V3, I start to see this sort of slur. Here's the P wave, and it goes right into uh, the QRS complex. This is called a delta wave. This is an example of pre-excitation or Wolf-Parkinson-White pattern, um, where a delta wave or a slurred upstroke to the QRS complex uh, is present. This represents an accessory pathway, a, a, a different connection than the AV node. Uh, between the atria and the ventricles. Here's another example of uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome where you can see some slurring, again, that Q wave, a very short PR interval. Um, there are a couple other um, subtleties to uh, diagnosing uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White uh, pattern. Often there's a big Q wave in lead three or an absence of a Q wave in V6. These are sort of supporting criteria, but the standard criteria is a short PR and a delta wave. Here's another example, again, um, looking at that just sort of slurred upstroke. Again, it can be a little bit subtle, but in combination with that short PR, it's quite specific, uh, it's quite uh, suggestive. This is an example of uh, right bundle branch block. We talked about the RSR prime in V1 uh, for incomplete right bundle branch block. The difference between incomplete and complete is how long is the QRS complex. So when it's more than 120 milliseconds, it's complete. And that's what this is. And um, right bundle branch block in isolation um, is actually one of the borderline findings. And in isolation would be considered a normal finding um, or normal ECG. Uh, borderline finding, but a normal ECG uh, in a in an athlete. You really need two of those borderline findings for the ECG to be abnormal. Um, this is an example of right bundle branch block, but with a QRS duration that's over 140 milliseconds, and this ends up in the red box. Um, any QRS duration over 140 milliseconds is considered abnormal. So when we look at V1, it just has a very broad width to it, more than 140 milliseconds, and that's in the red box. 
I mentioned um, that we do look at the axis in one and two, um, and we're um, not going to go in, in detail because you guys can all learn the hexaxial reference system to, to um, tell your attendings what the what the axis is of the ECG you're looking at. Um, we also look at the P wave, uh, again, whether or not it's um, uh, tall or wide, suggestions of, of atrial enlargement, there are definitions for that. Um, this is an example of two or more borderline findings that would make the ECG abnormal. Um, this uh, individual has uh, complete right bundle branch block. They also have left axis deviation um, where it's uh, up in one, uh, but down in AVF and also down in uh, lead two. So you know it's beyond minus 30, um, considered left axis deviation. Um, and uh, also a tall uh, P wave more than two and a half boxes representing right atrial enlargement. So this ECG needs more evaluation. Step five is to look at the pattern uh, at the bottom, making sure that there's a Q wave after every, excuse me, a QRS complex after every uh, P wave. Um, some examples where there might be things that show up that are different. Um, if we follow along here, here's a P wave, QRS complex, P wave, QRS complex, same thing here. And then here's a P wave and a dropped QRS complex. So this is a, a, a AV block. And the question is, which AV block is it? Um, when you have um, progressively prolonged PR interval, followed by a dropped uh, QRS complex, uh, that represents Mobitz type one, Winky block or second degree, uh, second degree AV block. And that's considered Mobitz type one is actually a physiologic or normal finding. If you exercise this athlete, that goes away and is um, not present anymore. Here's another example of just uh, frequent P waves, um, three P waves to every two QRS complexes, and then you drop this. So this is like a three to two uh, block uh, representing second degree AV block. Notice that the PR interval doesn't prolong, it stays constant, um, and then you have a dropped uh, complex. So this is not Mobitz type one, this is Mobitz type two, second degree AV block. Step six is to look at the QT interval, and this can um, trick people up a little bit. The QT interval, um, I like to find a QRS complex that starts on a big line. Um, the big line, uh, the big boxes are 200 milliseconds, um, and usually V2 or V5 shows the best ending of the, of the T wave. So beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave, just looking roughly, this QT interval looks like about uh, 400 milliseconds. So how about this ECG? When we look at this ECG, you could be confused um, looking if we looked at V3. So there's a little extra hump here. And if you include what's called the U wave, you've done it wrong and you've falsely elevated the QT interval. Um, and so you don't want to do that. And so don't include the U wave. Um, there's something called the tangential method to uh, identify the end of the T wave. And it's drawing a line on the back slope of the, of the T wave to see where it crosses the isoelectric line. And that's really the interval that you're going to measure. Um, to define the QT interval. Here's just another uh, figure of pictorial showing that. Again, you start at the beginning of the QRS complex to where that, um, that tangential line would cross, and that would be where you're measured. You wouldn't measure it uh, and include the U-wave ever. This was an athlete that came to us for uh, cardiac clearance uh, before she tried out for one of the uh, national uh, level soccer teams. And she had a, a broad um, QT interval that measured almost 500 milliseconds. And if we blow that up a little bit, you can see um, not just that she had a, a broad QT interval well over uh, 400, but about 500 milliseconds. Uh, she also had an abnormal morphology of that T wave. And a notched T wave is another suggestive finding um, for long QT syndrome, specifically long QT type 2. I want to. Um, um, turn my attention to just a couple other comments um, and then come back to some ECGs in a little bit. Um, you may be looking at this slide and wondering, um, what is Dr. Tresner talking about? Easy application of sports medicine and he shows a picture of a Lachman test and I'm not talking about uh, ECG so we can do preoperative visits um, for our orthopedic colleagues. What I'm, what I'm talking about here is I think when we get interested in sports medicine, we really wanna learn things right. We wanna learn our physical exam and when I have students and, and residents work with me, you know, understanding how to do a proper Lachman test is a fundamental skill to being a sports medicine physician. And I would argue that proper ECG interpretation, understanding how to interpret an athlete's ECG 
is equally, if not more important, fundamental skill for a sports medicine physician. You may not use ECG in the setting of screening. That can be your choice later on, but you have to know how to look at it because eventually you're going to get one for some reason, either diagnosis, uh, diagnostic purposes, or for screening, and you really do have to know it. So ECG interpretation is just as important as all our other physical exam skills that we're learning. If you look at the purpose of cardiovascular screening, I find this uh, interesting to reflect upon. So this was um, the AMSSM uh, position statement on cardiovascular screening in athletes. Um, Fran O'Connor and I were, were co-chairs of this. And I'll just read the, the primary goal of cardiovascular screening um, that we wrote. So the goal of screening in competitive athletes is to identify underlying cardiac disorders predisposing to sudden cardiac arrest and death with the intent to reduce morbidity and mortality by mitigating risk through individualized, patient-centered, and disease-specific medical management. In other words, we have to identify these people early so we can intervene and hopefully make sports safer or perhaps just make life safer. We published a study recently on comparing ECG to the American Heart Association 14-point evaluation. Um, and in the commentary of that, um, the, the leader, ECG outperformed the American Heart Association 14 point pretty much on every uh, level, every uh, performance measure. But in the commentary, there was some criticism about our article, which is fine. It was written by the lead author of the AHA. Um, and it's interesting because they, they also cited the purpose of cardiovascular screening and they said exactly the same thing. Um, we should underscore that all participants in this debate agree that the purpose of broad-based screening of asymptomatic young student athletes is identification of those cardiovascular diseases that increase the risk of sudden death, either on the athletic field or elsewhere. So I could not agree more with that. Um, I, it's just a matter of what protocol you wanna use to, to fulfill this objective. Um, we have a real problem um, in, in the US and within sports medicine. Um, on one side of cardiovascular screening is the traditional just history and physical. Many of us have had it when we were young athletes. Um, history and physical, um, there is robust evidence that this is inadequate to adequately identify individuals with heart conditions at risk for sudden death, and it does not fulfill the primary objective of screening. On the flip side, you have centers like the University of Washington that have used ECG, um, gained experience, are competent in ECG interpretation. That, that honestly just provides a better screen. We can identify athletes with heart problems better than if you do a history and physical, and we can do it um, in an accurate way. But this requires training and education and infrastructure. And right now we have a big gap between what happens commonly in practice and, and what perhaps is uh, a better screen when done accurately that can better fulfill um, the objective of screening, perhaps save lives. So for the future of sports medicine listening, um, this is a really important skill to think about over time. But with that evolution of the ECG interpretation standards, we've really done a good job. We've lowered the false positive rate over time and maintained that sensitivity. So we haven't lost the ability um, to identify people with pathologic heart conditions. We've just lowered the number of false positives, which has really just changed the whole conversation about how we should be screening. So how good can the international criteria be? Um, this was the study done by uh, Nicola Hyde, our, our resident um, last year. This actually won the best research award at the AMSSM uh, last year. And uh, we look back at over uh, 5,000 ECGs done in college athletes and we applied the Seattle criteria and international criteria and compared it also to Cardia, which is a, a um, ECG device with a computer algorithm or software algorithm that, that uses uh, modern standards as well. And so for expert overread, I'll just show you how good um, the international criteria can perform. So in that cohort of college athletes, only uh, the, the total positive rate for or an abnormal ECG was 1.6%. And the false positive rate was only 1.3%, which is probably better than most screening tests we do in medicine. And then the positive predictive value of an abnormal ECG is one in six of those individuals had a pathologic heart condition at risk for sudden death. And so the international criteria have done a nice job when applied accurately to lower the false positive rate um, with, a, with a strong positive predictive value to, do, to fulfill the criteria, uh, fulfill the objective of why we're screening. Um, this should not be the end of your ECG education. There is a full online course 
um, on ECG interpretation in athletes with six relevant modules. It is freely available. The URL is at the top, uwsportscardiology.org backslash e academy. Um, this link is also on the AMSSM uh, website and encourage you to uh, look at that. So a couple uh, tests for you at the end. Is this uh, normal or abnormal? Um, everyone take a second to look at this. I hope everyone has identified as you come through from V1, V2, V3, you start to see T wave inversion of V4, it extends to V5 and V6, also an AVF and lead two. This is infralateral T wave inversion. This is an abnormal ECG. Everyone should recognize that. And we shouldn't be fooled by the fact that it may also have a black athlete repolarization variant that would be considered normal if that's all it showed in V3 and V4. Just a reminder on the left here, physiologic um, black athlete repolarization variant uh, combined, confined to leads V1 through V4 um, compared to pathologic T wave inversion that extends beyond V4 and when we're talking about card, uh, most cardiomyopathy in the V5 and V6. And then an ECG like this that would be considered markedly uh, abnormal. I don't think anyone uh, listening would miss this ECG. Again, if we follow our, our steps for interpretation um, as we come into V4, clear ST segment depression, huge T wave inversion, um, also ST segment depression in our, in our uh, inferior and uh, limb leads. Um, this is a markedly abnormal ECG that needs a comprehensive evaluation inclusive of a cardiac MRI. So just a few uh, take home points. Uh, we should follow the international criteria recommendations for ECG interpretation, as well as the secondary evaluation of ECG abnormalities. Um, consider the six steps for accurate ECG interpretation in athletes. I think this will allow you to look for all the things listed in the red box, um, as well as the yellow box uh, in the international criteria guideline. Lateral or infralateral T wave inversion requires a contrast enhanced um, cardiac MRI. And then don't forget that if that is normal, serial cardiac imaging is required for athletes with markedly abnormal ECGs and normal initial imaging. So thank you very much for, for listening your attention. I'm going to switch the screen back to uh, video, I think, where maybe we can have a little Q&A and, and Chris uh, can turn his mic on and help me with that. Um, so hang on just a second here. Hello, Dr. Dresner. That was awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone, for your attention. So, Chris, uh, am I on? Can you see me? Let's see here. Um, you're the, the PowerPoint's on right now. Oh, the PowerPoint's on. All right. So, let me... Uh, Get out of that and stop sharing. Yes. How are we doing now? Perfect. Great. Yep. Um, some feedback. Hold on. Should be good now. Okay. All right. We have one question in. How long do we follow the patient uh, when they have an abnormal EKG? Uh, you in that uh, case that you brought up with the basketball player, you followed them for a couple of years, and then after a couple of years, yeah. you saw the abnormal EKG kind of uh, grow. Um, if maybe he had a normal EKG after two years, three years, but maybe still a little bit abnormal, how long would you follow that? Um, I would follow them annually through their competitive athlete career. So we've had, um, I've had professional athletes um, with that type of market, markedly abnormal ECG where we follow them on an annual basis and they do not show evidence of, of cardiomyopathy. Um, so we follow them annually through their competitive athlete career. When their athlete career is over, um, then I think it's reasonable to follow them probably every three to five years. Uh, at what age would you recommend that athletes get an EKG and how often? That's a really good question. Um, you know, we offer ECG screening starting at age 12. Um, at age 12 is when some of the cardiomyopathy starts to show. Um, if you have an electrical disorder, it probably shows by then. And certainly we have, um, you know, a number of middle school athlete deaths um, each year. Um, 
So starting at age 12 and every two years to me would be the ideal way to do screening. I think in the setting of more limited resources, um, you know, starting perhaps one time in high school um, when they're coming to high school or perhaps uh, every two years or maybe just at age 16, it's hard to understand exactly what the most cost effective um, way to approach this is. Because ECG screening is so dependent on the provider who's doing the, the screening, once you're comfortable with it, um, I think it'd be fair to say that you don't go back and, and not do it. So once we became comfortable with our college athletes, there's not a high school athlete that I see for PPE that I would not do an ECG on. Um, same thing with the middle school athlete. So um, I think in an ideal world, it starts at age 12 and goes every two years. Um, at a minimum, I think you do it once in high school and certainly through college. The reason that um, uh, that's important also is that cardiomyopathy um, has the, uh, is a genetic disorder with variable expression, meaning that the phenotypic expression of HCM and some of the other cardiomyopathies often show up late in adolescence mm -hmm. and, er and uh, young adulthood, like my college basketball player. So you could be normal at age 16 and have HCM at age 18. And so that's the reason you need to do serial screening. So college basketball player is kind of the prototypical um, athlete that we talk about with a, a Hokum. Um, at that age where we start testing them, age 13, do we see any kind of um, a basketball players at age 13? Or is it kind of anybody there that you might see in that EKG? Yeah. Yeah, who do you test? Uh, you know, it's not, I don't know of evidence that, that basketball players have more HCM than um, other athletes. They're at higher risk of sudden death for reasons that we don't really know, but it's not clear that they actually have more HCM. Um, and I'd be cautious. I, um, um, Hokum describes a type of HCM. And I think, unfortunately, I learned it as that also, um, which is really sort of a misnomer because hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy implies that there's left ventricular alpha track obstruction, which is really only present in about 25% of HCM patients at rest and maybe 50% with exercise. Um, so not everyone has the O um, or for hokum or obstruction. So really it's HCM and some of them have HCM with, with some obstruction, uh, obstructive findings. Um, but um, our basketball players seem to be at higher risk. And again, I'm not sure we understand the, the uh, exact detail. Um, black athletes are also at higher risk. And so if you're looking for groups to maybe use resources most cost effectively. Yeah, I do think that you start with our high risk groups. You know, 60% of sudden cardiac death uh, in the US occurs in two sports alone, and that's um, football and boys basketball. And so um, perhaps really that's where we should start screening first and then let it fall out to the other athlete groups as well. Okay. Do we know why kids can have T wave inversion in V2 and V3 that is normal? Um, it's just normal. So uh, it's not just kids, it's adults too. And so T wave inversion, um, if you're specifically talking about V1 and V2, um, even some adults will have T wave inversion in V1 and V2. And because we exclude V1 in, in the criteria, for an adult to have abnormal T wave inversion, it has to extend in V2 and V3. If you're talking about the kid or the, the, the pediatric, um, uh, athlete under the age of 16 or juvenile T inversion, um, that can be present in V1, V2, and V3. And I just think it's a remnant of their um, a little more uh, right heart um, uh, dominance um, from earlier in life. Okay. Would we order the cardiac MRI before they see cardiology or wait for them to order it? <laughs> um, I order it. Um, and I think it just depends on your comfort zone. So um, when I have a markedly abnormal ECG, I, I certainly get the echo first. I'm on the horn and, and, and calling or, or, or communicating somehow with my cardiology team because obviously I want them to know about it. I want them to look specifically at the echo. Um, and then often, often I order the, the MRI as well. So I just I think it depends on your comfort. Um, for me, I, I, I believe strongly in the um, secondary testing that we outlined in the international criteria document. This was um, formed by um, cardiologists from around the world who have a lot of experience in, in sports cardiology. And so those international guidelines are, are, are really sound. And 
Um, I think it's okay to, to follow them. I think a lot of sports medicine physicians, when you're familiar with it, you'll actually be guiding the cardiologist a little bit about sort of what's next or perhaps being your patient's advocate to push for the testing that's recommended. Uh, would we, or, oh, sorry, the black athlete trend is abnormal outside of black athletes. Is that correct? If so, is it indicative of any certain pathology? It's not indicative of any pathology. And um, if you take that same black athlete and let's say they get injured and they stop exercising, um, usually that repolarization variant goes away. So it seems to be training related um, that when you're conditioned, they, they get the repolarization variant. Um, right now it's considered normal in black athletes. There is some preliminary evidence that the same finding can be normal in um, uh, other athletes independent of race. So Domenico Corrado and his group did a, a study looking at um, athletes in Italy that were mostly Caucasian and all of the individuals with that pattern, um, J-point elevation, convex XC segment elevation, followed by TV inversion, um, did not, and combined with V1 through V4, did not have any pathology on their uh, cardiac imaging. And I know for me, I've definitely worked up a number of uh, Caucasian athletes with that ETG pattern, and I have never found pathology. Um, and I have colleagues in South America who have sort of done the same. And so I think with time, that specific repolarization pattern will probably just be considered normal regardless of race, but right now it's just considered normal in our black athletes. Okay, that was a good question. Um, we have a question. What questions would uh, should we be asking during routine physicals to find athletes at high risk of cardiac abnormal or abnormalities? So, what questions like like history yeah, questions history or symptoms? And, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. We don't we don't want to completely discount the the history and 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 physical exam, for instance. But um, understand that when we do the questionnaires, the questionnaires have a very high um, false response rate or um, a very high response. Rate. So about 30% of athletes will check one of the boxes on those heart questions. So which are the ones that I think make the most uh, um, impact? Um, number one, uh, syncope with exercise. So an athlete who's passed out during exercise, during the race, during the game um, is a concerning uh, potential sign of underlying cardiovascular disease and they need a comprehensive workout. So we're not that talking about the distinct yeah, I'm not talking after the race. If you've ever been involved in uh, an endurance event, you know, so many people get lightheaded and, and want to lay down or even pass out once they finish the race. That's different. That's exercise associated collapse. There's some physiologic reasons why that's happening with a dilated vascular bed um, and you lose your, your muscle pump and venous return when you stop moving. And so um, that's different. If that happens enough, that it probably needs some uh, additional evaluation and at minimum an ECG. But the athlete who has passed out before the finish line is very concerning and certainly one that's passed out while playing soccer, while playing basketball, or while on the football field. You know, that needs a comprehensive eval in concert with your cardiologist. Um, another symptom that I think um, is uh, can be problematic is, is exertional chest pain. And I think it's important how you ask about it. Um, the American Heart Association lists that question way too broadly. They, they ask athletes if they have any chest pain, pressure, um, uh, tightness in their chest, and almost like what athlete doesn't have a little bit of tightness in their chest when they push themselves hard. What I ask athletes is, do you get chest pain during exercise that makes you stop exercising? And so when an athlete says, yes, I have this sort of central chest pain um, only at peak exertion, um, and it makes me stop exercising and then the chest pain quickly goes away, then I worry about some ischemic type um, uh, chest pain, which could be related to cardiomyopathy, could be related to an anomalous coronary artery, and I think that needs to be investigated. And then I'd say the third thing that you want to ask um, from a history standpoint is about family history. Family history is a really strong marker of, um, of risk for sudden death. So if you have a family history of an inherited uh, inheritable, excuse me, um, uh, genetic heart disease um, or a family history of premature sudden death under the age of 40. It's a very, very strong risk factor. So that's another thing you have to ask for. All right. Those are really good questions. Um, what is your specific protocol at University of Washington for screening your athletes? 
Um, you just focus in on all of our athletes. football or? No, 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 no. We, we screen all our athletes. Um, so every athlete who comes to UW um, as a freshman athlete or if they transfer here, they get a um, history, physical and ECG. Um, and then just uh, last year, we started rescreening our high risk groups. Um, so we rescreen um, football, basketball, and men's soccer, which represent 75% of all sudden death, those three sports. Um, we rescreen them again um, after two years. And most, most places, most colleges that are doing ECG screening probably are only doing their freshmen. And I think those recommendations are completely arbitrary. Um, and we were included in that. And when we really thought about it, knowing that some things develop later, I think it made sense to, to screen them again. Um, screening every two years through adolescence and then on matriculation to college came from American Heart Association American Heart Association recommendations using the history and physical. Um, I mean, when we think about why we're using ETG and really doing the best we can, I think there's probably reason to screen again, certainly in our high risk groups. That's what we do at UW. All right, and our last question, this goes back to the history um, that we were asking before. What questions would you ask during the history? Um, if mm -hmm. any of those questions were positive, would you order an echo or start with an EKG? I always start with an ECG, but some of them need an echo as well. So if you have an athlete who's had syncope, um, they need an ECG, an echo, a stress test, um, and a 24-hour holder. So. Um, it really depends on, on what the symptom is, but um, so usually those red flag type symptoms or family history, they need more than just an ECG. Um, when you do a lot of cardiovascular screening and you're, you're doing PPEs and using history and physical, you find that athletes have a ton of positive history questionnaires. And I think you can really only um, um, consider a lot of those positive questions normal in the setting of something else that's more objective like an ECG. So in the setting of a normal ECG, I think you can discount some of the symptoms. But when they're really the red flag symptoms or family history, you need more work up. Um, okay, one last question just slipped in. I know yeah. you asked about uh, sudden death in relatives younger than 40, but do you ever ask about family members who drowned? Uh, surprise drownings and QT interval prolongation is commonly tested association on EM boards, and I'm curious if this is, if this too is applied to sports cardiology screening. Um, that's a great, that's a, that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, in our heart health um, questions that we use now in our um, community screens, we have a question on um, not just drowning, but also on uh, syncope or um, sudden cardiac arrest related to uh, noise, loud noises, um, both of which can be related to uh, long QT syndrome. And so really, really important question. I think in the um, general population for screening, I, I, we um, noise has been a part of, I think, the PPE4 for a while. And I'm, I'm not sure how many people have a positive response to that. But it's really important to understand that, that if, it, if you have uh, a history of syncope, um, related to uh, exposure to, to cold water or uh, related to loud noise. That, that's concerning for a, a channelopathy. Oh, yeah, that was a really good question. Um, Dr. Dresner, thank you so much for your time this evening. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and i um, happy to entertain uh, um, additional questions if you need to. Uh, my email is uh, available through AMSSM, or you could uh, jdresner at uw.edu. And I encourage everyone to take the modules um, yeah. through, our, through our E Academy. Yeah, those are great. Um, and those are on AMSSM as well. Yeah. Um, this podcast or this actually um, webinar will be posted tomorrow on AMSSM. Um, so feel free to watch it again because there's a lot of great information. Terrific. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Aloha.